Welcome to our May 22nd, 2017 board meeting. Could we have a roll call, please? Here. 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 Thank you. The first item on the agenda is approval of minutes from the April 24th, 2017 regular meeting and the May 1st, 2017 special meeting. Motion, please. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Thank you. Next item is written communication. Do we have any written communication, Dr. Bavis? Uh, actually, for the first time, we do. Right. <laughs> pause. Um, so we're going to pause on that for a second. Uh, we actually received uh, certificates of election for the uh, elected board members uh, from the Cook County Clerk, and Dr. Witherspoon has those uh, with him, and th we got those from David Orr. Thank you. Has a seal on them at all? Did I get one of those? No, I don't even remember. This new? This oh, like, before. Oh. I don't think so. Jonathan, did you get one last year? Oh, Two years ago? Do you remember these? Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. I remember getting one when I was first elected, but I don't think I got I think one, they got one they when I was reelected. Yeah. Mark, did okay. you get one? Oh, well. Jealousy. Nice. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I will keep that. All right, so uh, we are at information items. Um, we have recognition of DECA international qualifiers. Well, I'm going to introduce the, the uh, faculty advisor, Jenny Weber. Uh, Shelly, are you going to join in this? Or, okay, Jenny, come on up. Uh, actually, actually you, you can go right up to that microphone, and uh, you're going to hear some really great uh, achievements and recognitions that our DECA students have uh, accomplished this year. Uh, let me explain. Uh, Jenny, you go ahead and give whatever recognitions you're going to give. Uh, we're eager to hear it all. Students, let me give you the, your directions, and, and even if the first person gets it mixed up, we'll help you, and then we'll all know what to do. After you've all been introduced, then we want the board to be able to congratulate you. So you'll start at the horseshoe there, and you'll come around, and you'll shake all of our hands. When you get to the board president, she has a pin for you, uh, which, which is just a little memento uh, of, of being here uh, at a board meeting and being honored. Uh, we use the same pin at every board meeting, so we didn't have anything actually crafted for the, this event, but I know you got wonderful medals and, uh, and, and that. And then you'll go on around. Uh, uh, and, and complete uh, the horseshoe and shaking hands. So, okay, we're ready to go. Um, so this past March, myself along with Mr. Dave Feely and Mr. Chris Manila took 32 students to the 2017 Illinois State Career Development Competition. This competition hosted over 1,300 high school students across the state of Illinois. Students across the state of Illinois competed in hopes of advancing to the International Career Development Conference that would be held in April at Anaheim, California. I had the pleasure of working with these 16 students individually on an 11 to 30 page marketing research, community service, public relations, or entrepreneurship paper in various categories. It is my pleasure to recognize all 16 of those students who placed not only in the top 10, but also in the top three of their event at the state competition. These students earned the opportunity to compete at the international competition that hosted over 17,000 high school students acro from across the United States, as well as from other countries such as Mexico, Canada, Guam, Puerto Rico, China, Germany, and many other countries. Each of these students have dedicated hours of their time since the end of August through the end of April working on their projects. They have dedicated their study hall time, lunch time, as well as coming in as early as 6.45 in the morning, well. it's early, <laughs> and, stating, and staying as late as 5.30 p.m. to work with me on their presentations as well as their projects. Their hard work and dedication truly showed not only at the state competition, but also at the international competition. The following individuals qualified in their written event to attend the international competition that was held this past April. Michelle Malazzo, who unfortunately is not here tonight, 
um, but she took first place in her community service project, focusing in on running a canned food drive outside of Mariano's in the months of November and December. Over 500 cans and $150 was collected during the four times she held her drive outside of Mariano's. Sasha Balasanov and Catherine Mann. Where are you, Sasha? Yeah. Come Wave on over. your hands when you're called. <laughs> okay. Um, they placed second place in their community service project, focusing in on being members of Wild Kit Buddies. Both of these young women earned competency at the international competition, earning at least an 80% on their presentation. Sasha, here's your competency certificate. Mikey Barrera, who unfortunately is not here tonight, took first place in his public relations campaign, focusing in on Latinos in technology, where he hosted various events targeted towards Latinos here at Evanston Township High School, and focusing in on technology such as virtual reality, chrome zone repairs, hours of code, and programming. Mikey also earned competency at the international competition. Bronson Engel and Mikey, I'm sorry, and Mickey Hoy took first place in hospitality and tourism operations research event, focusing in on Supreme Burrito number one. They worked, <laughs> they worked on enhancing their social, local, and mobile promotions. Both of these young men earned competency at the international level, earning at least an 80% on their presentation. Josh Rousey took second place in the Hospitality and Tourism Operation Research event, focusing in on Chipotle and enhancing their social, local, and mobile promotion. Nick Parafel and Ethan Eigenbohr took first place in their creative marketing, focusing in on Sarkis and how to enhance their current marketing tactics. <laughs> they also took first place in Franchise of Business, focusing in on Herm's Palace with a plan to open a franchise under their guidance. It should be noted that these two, I'm sorry, it should be noted that this is a first time occurrence since at least 2008, where ETHS has had students compete in more than one written event, as well as their role play, and place in not one, but two written events at the state level. Jake Savitas and Margot Leviton took first place in their finance and operations research event, focusing in on First Northern Credit Union. They create ways to boost their social, local, and mobile promotions. Both of these students earn competency at the international competition, earning at least an 80% on their presentation. Nora Ferguson took first place in her sports and entertainment operations research event, focusing in on fitness matrix and how to enhance their social, local, and mobile promotion. Nora also earned competency in her presentation at the international competition. Jack Caldwell took third place in his startup a business plan, focusing in on creating a business plan of his choice, Meats for Mates. He developed a plan to purchase a farm, raise cattle, and create boltong, or dried meat, selling his product in multiple kiosks in different shopping malls. Jack also earned competency on his presentation at the international competition. Matthew Ho and Jake Nagel took first place in their independent business plan, focusing on creating a, a business of their choice, Teamy. Teamy is a t-shirt production company based out of Boston. Elijah Sisako placed second place in his financial literacy promotional plan, where he came into my personal finance class and taught different lessons about credit, auto purchasing, and banking com uh, concepts. Elijah also earned competency at the international competition earning at least an 80% on his presentation. You're welcome. One thing that I would like to point out was last year that we brought 11 students to the international competition in Nashville, and we had five of those 11 earn competency. This year, with 16 students qualifying for international competition, we had 10 of them earn this award. The chapter continues to grow and be extremely successful, and I would like to thank the support from not only my co-advisors, Dave Feely and Chris Manila, 
but also the support of Shelly Gates and the ETHS community in allowing these students to participate in such an amazing organization. At this time, I would like to invite two students, Jake and Jack, to come up and say a few words in regards to their experience that they have had over the past two years that they have been involved in DECA. Uh, hello, my name is Jack Caldwell and I'm a junior. I'd like to start off with thanking the school board for allowing me to be here tonight and talk about my own experiences in the ETHS DECA chapter. DECA has really changed my view on what I think I want to do in my future. It showed me what I want to go into, which is business, as well as, what I th as, well as helping me with my problem solving skills. Uh, the club has helped me with my speaking skills and has also taught me professional skills such as presenting a business topic to a real life uh, businessman and woman. Uh, this club does an amazing job of applying what I've learned in school to real business projects and problems. I'd like to thank the school for providing me with the opportunity to join this amazing club. Uh, I've been very fortunate to go and compete in Anaheim and in Nashville uh, in the last two years, places I might not have traveled to if, I, if it weren't for uh, the help and support from the school. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Feely, Mr. Haller, and Mr. Manila for organizing all the after-school meetings. And lastly, I'd like to thank Ms. Weber, who spent countless hours upon hours of her personal free time uh, working with each project and getting to know each individual. Your dedication and commitment to the club does not go unnoticed, and we thank you for that. I'd like to start off by thanking the school board for allowing me and Jack to speak tonight on our experiences that we've had with DECA. Um, my name again is Jake Savitas, and I've been a member of the Evanston chapter of DECA for two years now. Both years under the direct guidance of Ms. Weber, I've been fortunate enough to place first at state and qualify for the international competition. Without Ms. Weber's hard work and dedication to DECA and my fellow students, my accomplishments would not have been possible. Throughout my time in DECA, I have learned and improved upon many skills that are useful and applicable to many situations in life. I have learned valuable public speaking skills and quick thinking skills. I have also improved on my organization and planning skills. I improved my public speaking skills by practicing my presentation many times to get ready to speak to a complete stranger. I improved my quick thinking by being forced to think on my feet when the judge has a question that I had not prepared for. I improved my organization and planning skills by working with Ms. Weber and planning out when our presentation would be created piece by piece. All of these skills are necessary in life and I would like to thank DECA for helping me improve on each one. I'm very grateful that the school offers such an incredible program that offers such great experiences and skills that will stay with me forever. I would like to again thank all of the club advisors, Mr. Feely, Mr. Manila, and especially Ms. Weber for all of their dedication to the club and the students in it. Without them, none of this would have been possible. Thank you. Wow. All right, let's shake hands. <laughs> So I just want once again uh, to uh, congratulate our DECA award winners and for all your work.
you will not hurt our feelings if you would like to leave now instead of being uh, stuck here for the whole meeting. But Ms. Weber, thank you also for being so well organized. That was a beautifully organized presentation. Go kids. How exciting. Very cool. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's just like me during the campaign. Huh? There goes our audience. Uh -huh. <laughs> You'll never know. <laughs> All right. Well, we're off to a good start. Yes. Okay. We are at a very special part of our agenda, item number seven. Um, where we will first recognize our retiring student board member. So, honor. <laughs> it's really um, amazing that the year has gone by so fast. And I, I'd like to open it up to the board to see if anybody would like to um, offer words, and then I'll go last. Mr. Metz. I'll say it first because if I say it last, everyone will have already said how amazing <laughs> she is. Um, Honor, I think what I appreciate most is uh, your preparation and uh, the way you've kept yourself informed about the issues that are important to students and really spoke for your, your students and we heard you and we heard them through you. And most of all, I enjoy your relentless optimism and enthusiasm. Thank you. Maybe I should go since I've, yes. well, I'm one of the newbies. Yes. <laughs> wow. Uh, just by the admiration that everyone around this table has for you and how they speak so highly of you, um, I have tremendous respect for the role that you play here at such a huge school. Um, and from what I hear from everyone else, you've done it so responsibly and you've come prepared. And it's an awesome responsibility to help, to help set the, the, the tone for the student population of the school. So um, I'm hoping the person who replaces you will be just as awesome. <laughs> China? Well, the first question I always have for honor is, how many hours a night do you sleep? <laughs> the reason I ask that is, you know, the debate and the, and the English Honors Awards and, 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 you know, it's just, I don't, you, you have an amazing amount of energy, which is, is, is you know, to be I jealous of. <laughs> you sleep a lot? <laughs> but I, I think that the most impressive thing I have found about honor is the way you exemplify your, the students you represent with the passion and the empathy and the courage, I think, you know, probably most dramatically represented recently with the whole transgender policy is that, that your, your passion was there, your representative quality of, of the students you represented, both those who had the courage to step forward on behalf of themselves and those who had the empathy to, to fight for their, for their classmates. And you were literally their representative in, in the truest sense. And uh, there's nothing more you could ask of someone in your position. I think, Honor, what you did so well is that you spoke on um, all those issues that affected every student. So you were an advocate for every student. I, you know, I can go back and think about the summits to, you know, the last, what Jonathan just mentioned, but across the board, anytime there was um, an issue or a missing voice, from a student's perspective and all the adults were making decisions, you made it very clear in your, uh, in your approach that, yeah, let me remind you, this is about the students, this is about our community, this is about our school, and this is how they're thinking. And so I just appreciate you being informed across the entire uh, school community and, and then your honesty, you know, the rawness in which you came and, and said what you had to say so that we could hear everything that needed to be heard. So I appreciate that, and I know that it will grow and get bigger um, as you grow and, and become more mature in your voice and everything that you plan on accomplish in the future. So thank you for your service. So 
I just want to say I didn't have the honor of <laughs> serving with Honor. However, I met Honor when she moved to Evanston before she was in kindergarten. So I have known her a bit from afar. Her dad is still a good friend of my husband's. And uh, it's just a privilege to see you grow up to be such an amazing young woman and what you've done here and what you're going to do after. So congratulations and thank you. Good. Well, Honor, it's really been terrific to, um, in, it, until Jude showed up, I was sitting, I think, closer to you at some point. <laughs> um, I've appreciated very much um, having you here at the table with us. And um, I think Jonathan was right. Um, I think a, a point in time where I think you really stood up for your fellow students was around our gender identity policy. And um, your remarks in particular at our larger, historically large policy committee meeting um, with a pretty big audience were incredibly moving and very heartfelt and I think um, uh, really reflected your deep understanding of the importance of that issue and, and it was much appreciated. Um, but I also think about your support of the summits and the um, dress code issues which have surfaced during the year. Um, you haven't hesitated in the politest way possible um, to bring your views on those subjects to, this, to, to our meetings always with a smile on your face. Um, and see you're doing it right now. <laughs> and it's just, it's, that is going to carry you very far. Your professionalism has been very welcome. And I've really appreciated having you here. So best of luck to you. Thank you. So Mark's right. Every, I'm, I'm the last and <laughs> everyone has said everything. However, I just want to say that um, I too have so much appreciated your presence on this board. And, and I, I believe that you have really served your peers well. You've represented them well. You've spoken for your peers. You've, you've taught us all, brought us all back to um, the student voice. Um, and, and you've held us all accountable. So I appreciate, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm remembering um, right after the November election, your words stopped this meeting. I remember being unable to proceed um, because I had to kind of regather myself after you uh, spoke so eloquently. Um, so you, you're more than a student uh, member. You are a board member. You've been a board member. You prepare like a board member. You're informed as, as, as well as any of us. And you ask questions that um, let us know that you're really thinking about these issues. Um, so um, I guess what happens is that you come and you make your presence known for, to us for one year. It feels like it's been longer than a year, um, yet it feels like it's gone by so fast that I want to just kind of hold you back. <laughs> um, but I can't do that. Um, so instead, I will say to you the best, my best, wish you well. And I'm sure we'll hear so many wonderful things about you, Honor. Thank you for giving your time to this board. Thank you for serving your community, your Evanston Township High School community. And thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you so much. Can I speak now? You, you can. Cool. Okay, so I, when I was writing this, don't worry, it's not that long, I was thinking about how terrified I was this time last year. I think I met, messed up the oath somehow. I don't really remember how, but I know that I did. And I also couldn't figure out how the water pitchers worked. <laughs> so I was struggling with one, and then I realized that I was on camera, which made me panic more. And so I was really thirsty and panicking, and all I could get out of the water pitcher was this really, really loud dribble. <laughs> and I was so terrified. And I stayed terrified for the first few weeks of my term as student rep, but soon the work took over. I couldn't be terrified. I had stuff to do. And that stuff has been some of the most important work that I've done in high school. You're going to hear about at least two of those initiatives, the dress code and the kit card today, which is very exciting. 
Um, and the time I spent on the board changed how I thought about education and leadership and general being in the worldness, and I really appreciate that. And I'm thankful to all of you for teaching me those lessons and setting those examples for me. Throughout the school year, it was hard to have faith in political action, and it always is. And I'm still skeptical, but as student rep, I've learned that it is possible for elected officials not to oppress, but to support and empower their constituents. And that it's not the pantsuit or the American flag lapel pin that is required to be a good leader. Rather, compassion and the ability to listen are what are, is essential. So now it's up to you, Emma, the student rep, the board and administration who lead our school, and the active, incredible, inspiring ETHS students who walk these halls to be compassionate and understanding leaders. And I already see that. And the reason that I was able to learn how important those aspects are is because I was watching you. And the journey that ETHS is on right now is such a great one. We're on this journey because we've been making meaningful change that results from honest, productive conversations and initiatives. So keep listening to each other, or if you haven't been, start listening to each other, please. We're all in this room right now because there are thousands of Evanston kids who will spend four years of their lives here. We're all here to shape lives. I've never been able to get over how cool that is. And we've been doing well, and I know that we're going to do better. So I'll be watching from New York. I'm so grateful <laughs> for this experience. Thank you. Dr. Davis. Yeah, um, I'd like to enter a resolution uh, declaring the results of the student board election. Uh, Emma Stein, uh, 203 votes received. Brooklyn Love, 58 votes received. Uh, our student rep uh, for the next school year, uh, from today through next school year, is Emma Stein, student member of the Board of Education, and our alternate rep is Brooklyn Love. So I will need a um, motion and a second and a voice vote on that. Okay. Motion, please. Move approval. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 All right. So now, uh, if I could ask uh, Emma to join me at the podium, and we'll do the oath. Emma Stein, a student member, a student member of the Board of Education, of the Board of Education, of Evanston High School District, of Evanston High School District, 202, 202, County of Cook, County of Cook, Illinois, Illinois, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, to support the Constitution of the United States, to support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And faithfully discharge. And faithfully discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. To which I have been elected. To which I have been elected. Congratulations. Do the water. Welcome, Emma. <laughs> Thank you. All right. 
So we are ready to proceed um, with the report on the CTE programs. Mm -hmm. Shelley. And uh, Shelly Gates, the chair of uh, our uh, career and technical education program is here. Uh, Dr. Bavis is going to join her. And uh, uh, once again, uh, I know that uh, we try to make this an annual event or close to it. And uh, it seems like... Uh, <laughs> No. Oh. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but but uh, uh, it, it's always fun because there's always a lot more progress to report. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the new board members. I don't know if I've met you, but I'm Shelly. Um, it's nice to meet you. And I feel that it's pretty exciting for me to get to present today about career and tech ed partly because our DECA students were here, and they're such a good example of the work that we do in the department, so that's a really nice, um, a nice connection for me. So um, I did a written report, and I'm going to go through it with you um, and try to hit the highlights. Um, the report addresses the 2017 through 2022 district goal number one, equitable and excellent education, specifically relating to college and career readiness for all students with obviously a particular focus on career awareness and preparation. Um, the Career and Tech Ed Department, let's see if I know if this is gonna work, there we go. Um, the Career and Tech Ed Department <clears throat> invites students at ETHS to explore real world career and job related skills so they can successfully pursue a wide range of college and career options after high school. CTE students are engaged learners because they are taught through project-based learning with real-world problems. And I think the DECA students referred to that um, several yeah. times. Our instru instruction combines a problem-solving orientation, relevant technical skills in a particular field of study, and essential life skills, including working effectively with others. The CTE department offers 44 courses in 15 different career pathways. And that is include. Uh, there's a sheet that has all of our courses um, in the information that was passed around to everybody. Um, the students, a student request for CTE courses has increased by 30% since the 2013-2014 school year, which is shown in uh, the little chart up there. Um, and the school enrollment has increased as well, but that our school enrollments overall have increased by 9%, and CTE requests have re increased by 30. Um, and also, uh, we wanted to point out that CTE enrollments closely match the demographics of the ETHS student population, which you can see in the other chart, uh, which is on the left side. Uh, so, um, what I wanted to talk about a lot, uh, but I won't go on too long about this, is this is something that is very uh, important to ETHS, and um, it's something that I feel very passionately about. And I think that it's really important for all of us to be aware and to continue to learn about the importance of preparing students to enter the workforce after leaving high school, um, particularly given the abundance of entry and middle skill jobs in Evanston and the greater Chicagoland area, jobs that do not require a four-year degree. Nationally, the economy has changed dramatically. The manufacturing sector, for example, is growing and modernizing, creating a wealth of challenging, well-paying jobs for those with the skills to do them. According to an analysis by the Georgetown University Center for Education and the Workforce, the United States is more educated than ever, and the percentage of jobs in most sectors requiring post-secondary edu education and training beyond high school is steadily increasing. They estimate that of the 55 million job openings in the economy through the year 2020, 35% will require at least a bachelor's degree, 30% will require some college or an associate's degree, and 36% will not require an education beyond high school. Preparing our students for post-secondary success is not as simple as separating them into these three tracks, however. For example, the sum college category covers a wide mix of education and training experiences. That includes apprenticeship programs, short-term skills certifications, and associate's degrees. This is due to the continuing evolution of the modern American workforce, meaning that the old mental model of college-bound versus job-bound is a relic of the 60s and the 70s and should be thrown into the dustbin of economic history. 
these are no longer mutually exclusive categories. Focusing solely on college or career disadvantages all students. It's a very complex world out there. I know you all know that. And for us as a high school, to make sure that we're preparing our students for the career path, the post-secondary pathway that is right for them, we have to be very knowledgeable about all of this information. In addition uh, to the need to provide families with, oh, there we go. Oops, I went too far. Sorry. Can you? Okay, Pete's going to drive. I went too far, sorry. Um, in addition to a need to provide ways for students and families to understand the changing landscape of, and the pathways to post-secondary success, we're also faced with the challenge of embracing much broader definitions of success. This requires us to move beyond traditional academic measures to focus on skills, habits, competencies, and personality traits that will enable students to thrive in an increasingly automated and global world. For example, in their recent Future of Jobs report, the World Economic Forum provided a list of the top 10 skills which you can see listed here. Uh, these skills include, and think about how we can teach these skills in high school, and also how difficult it is to measure them. Complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision making, service orientation, negotiation, and cognitive <coughs> flexibility. This, these, that's, these are the skills that our students need when they leave here. So that's what's, why this is so vital for all of us to really think about how are we making sure that our students have these skills when they leave here. Uh, many of these skills are difficult to teach and measure. They require us as a school uh, to innovate, to experiment, and to work together in new ways. Uh, yeah, we can go to the next one, Pete. Thank you. Um, so basically, what I wanted to talk, uh, just I'm going to be brief, about three different goals that the CTE department has, which you can see listed here. We want to provide opportunities for students to develop skills they need to be successful in whatever post-secondary path that they choose. We also want to raise awareness of multiple pathways to post-secondary success, and we want to increase pathway opportunities for ETHS students, and I'm just going to give a little bit of examples for each one of those, and I tried to include a lot of pictures just to make it a little more interesting. Um, one of the things that we have been able to do, and I'm going to talk about women in engineering in a second, um, our, the CTE teachers have um, spent a lot of time this year learning um, about a range of different t ways of teaching that are really important for all teachers to be learning. Um, we are using project-based learning as an, that's one example, and I hope that all of you have heard of project-based learning, and if not, um, I would like to recommend you look it up. Um, we're also uh, using a lot of questioning in the classroom, using the question formulation technique, which is developed by the Right Question Institute. We also, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this, have collaborated with the math department to develop and implement two interdisciplinary courses that focus on the real-world application of academic skills, specifically math. Our geometry and construction and algebra and entrepreneurship courses provide students with a learning environment that focuses on collaboration, teamwork, problem solving, creativity, decision making, and responsibility. And both of those courses are offered at the regular and the honors level. This year, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary as a national Project Lead the Way Engineering High School. Project Lead the Way engages students in hands-on activities, projects, problems, and it empowers them to solve real-world challenges and inspires them to reimagine how they see themselves. Our current Project Lead the Way courses include Introduction to Engineering Design, which is offered in a mixed gender and a women-only format. We also teach principles of engineering, civil engineering and architecture, manufacturing engineering and robotics, digital electronics, and AP computer science software engineering, which is a combined AP Project Lead the Way course. We have experienced steady growth in our Project Lead the Way enrollment, and next year we will have approximately 350 students enrolled, which is a 13.5% increase over enrollment from this current school year. And these quotes are from our Women in Engineering class. These are quotes from two 
young women who are currently enrolled, uh, we have 20 students, in our women-only section of Intro to Engineering Design, which we can talk more about if you have questions about it. Next year, 25 students have chosen to take their first engineering class in our women-only environment. And as you can see from the quotes, um, one student said, I chose it, the all-girls section, because my ideas will be less likely to be shot down, more critiqued than criticized, more helpful criticism, I wouldn't be ashamed of anything, and I think that really gets at why we wanted to do a women, women's only uh, course. And another student said, I got a call from an adult male who is in business school. I babysit for his kids. He's doing a challenge exactly like what we're doing in our class, and he is in business school. I said, I can help you. I'm doing this right now as high school. Oh, I thought that was cute. Um, okay, so I, the CTE department, um, offer students the opportunity to earn a variety of industry-recognized certifications, and I have a list of those in the written report that I provided for you. Um, but they include pharmacy technician, gateways to opportunity level one, early care and education, serve safe food handler and serve safe food protection manager, National Institute of Metalworking Skills, and also an OSHA 10-hour general, general industry certification. This is showing you not only students who are earning certifications, but just to give you an example of some of the things that the students have been involved in. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Pete. Uh, students in CTE classes and extracurricular activities also develop their 21st century skills through a huge range of competitions and challenges, DECA being one of the big ones, but also uh, we had a wonderful algebra and entrepreneurship startup showcase this year. The students participate in the Constitutional Rights Foundation Equal Justice Under Law Student Conference. There was an amazing investment challenge at Soldier Field. Uh, the Illinois Science and Technology STEM Challenge was a great opportunity for our health sciences students. Northwestern University Kellogg High School Case Competition, uh, which is those young men in the corner up there at the brand new uh, Kellogg School, which is pretty fancy. Um, and also the Illinois Drafting Education Association State Competition, and that's just not even, I can't, even, I couldn't list them all. Um, also, we, CTE teachers are very involved in raising awareness of career options for students through a huge range of field trips. Uh, our public safety class obviously is going to the fire department, the police department, the Illinois police headquarters, and I won't list them all, but basically every career area, there are many, many field trips for the students to participate in. We also work very closely with the student services department and the college and uh, career center to increase student awareness of career pathways, and our CTE courses and programs are featured in the programs of study guide, which was provided for all of you. Pete is showing you what it looks like. Um, <laughs> that is designed to help students connect their course selections and extracurricular activities to their career interests and plans. And in March, CTE teachers brought classes to the first annual Work It Week presentations to learn about a variety of post-secondary pathways. We are also uh, very involved in partnering with YOU, the Youth Job Center, um, and the new WE program, which is part of HECI's uh, foundations program. And uh, we, are, we have a very strong relationship with Kristen Perkins in the NU ETHS partnership office. Who, she has been invaluable in making connections for our students. And we also have, uh, just working with younger students, we work with um, District 65, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students in our Wild Kid Engineering Camp, which we've been doing for the past five summers. And this year we have added a food adventure camp, and we're partnering with District 65 to add a literacy focus to our camps and to encourage opportunity youth to participate in the camps more fully. Um, so, and this slide that I have up here, this is really relating to our third goal, which is to increase pathway opportunities for ETHS students. This is a very exciting new program that we are piloting um, starting next year. Students will have the opportunity to train to be a water operator, and this is a partnership between our department, the, co the College and Career Center, and also the City of Evanston's Public Wor Works Water Department. And students can take an online course, or, and they can take it through our practicum class, and they can have a uh, paid summer apprenticeship 
uh, opportunity with the water department, either here in Evanston or in a, another area close by. Uh, there will be mentors, and Mr. Daryl King, who's the Water Production Bureau Chief, is such an amazing person for us to be working with. We have the interviews for students who are gonna, who are interested in participating for next year. We are interviewing uh, the student with their families tomorrow and Wednesday evening to make sure they really understand what they're getting into. But there's some amazing opportunities for students right out of high school to become water operators. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's an example. We have a lot of other things we're working on that relate to this idea of increasing the pathways for students that are not necessarily a traditional pathway. Um, and so the last slide, this is, these are basically the challenges that I see facing us, both as a school but particularly in our department, is aligning our curriculum to the rapidly changing world of work which is an almost impossible task, but it's really important for us to try. Uh, also increasing awareness and acceptance of multiple pathways to post-secondary success so that students can feel uh, a sense of pride when they have chosen something other than a four-year college track. Um, if it's the right pathway for them, we have to find ways to celebrate that and make them feel good about the choices they've made. We also need to continue to develop and sustain partnerships with employers and with post-secondary institutions, which is incredibly time-consuming but absolutely important for us to be able to do the work that we're doing. And we need to keep growing our interdisciplinary partnerships within ETHS so that all of um, our academic areas are not as siloed. We need to be working together because that's what the students really need. Um, and lastly, we have to ensure that our students have academic, technical, and employability skills when they leave here. Every single student, they need to have all of those skills. So those are ch obviously challenges, but also huge opportunities for us as a school. And I think I have one more slide, Pete, because it has a great photo. So just uh, to end, this is a field trip that our engineering and architecture students took last week. We have an amazing parent who is a construction engineer with the McCormick Place uh, situation. I don't even know what to call it. It's like this huge thing that's going on. But they are building a giant hotel at McCormick Place, and the students were able to go on site. Um, we borrowed the hard hats from Geometry and Construction, and everyone had to wear an orange shirt, so it made a really great photo. But they also had an amazing opportunity. Miss Curtis, one of our engineering teachers, said it was the best field trip she's ever been on. So I wanted to end with that, um, just to give you a little positive at the end there. So that's it. Sorry if it was too long. I tried. I could go on for hours, as Pete is aware. Sorry. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. It was great, great report. So uh, rich, lots of really good opportunities. Um, so questions from the board. Pat. Hi. Um, thank you so much. That's a terrific report, and obviously a lot of great work behind it, um, the report and all of the the education part. Um, what my question was on the last um, bullet of your last slide is just, do you have any examples of how, I know that students have requirements to do at least some coursework in your area, but mm -hmm. um, is there any examples of spreading this more uh, across so that other students who aren't this semester in a CTE class are getting exposure to mm -hmm. career possibilities and pathways? Yeah, that is a real, that's the, obviously a huge challenge for us. I do think that we've made um, some significant inroads with uh, both geometry and construction and also algebra and entrepreneurship, which are co-taught classes with a math teacher and a CTE teacher. And I would also say within the engineering world, uh, more and more students are taking engineering classes. Engineering really is applied math and science. Um, and also a lot of employability skills and problem solving kind of thrown in there. I do think that um, the students in those courses are starting to see more and more connections. Uh, but clearly, we have some work to do as a school. And in terms of um, in increasing the connections with the science department, for example, um, but also uh, students need to learn how to write in a technical way. They need to be able to 
um, understand nonfiction, they need to be able to read computer programming manuals and actually be able to program. So all of the skills are so interconnected. And I think we are doing a much better job of um, all of us understanding those connections, but we still have a lot of work to do. I'd like to add one thing to that, and that's that um, under ESSA, which is the new NCLB, the, um, there is a uh, post-secondary uh, component that has to do with uh, college and career readiness. Uh, so we're no longer work working the or hyphen, we're working the and. Um, and that's going to require us to collect data on, uh, on really um, job shadows, job experiences, summer employability, summer work, practicum experiences, uh, and, really and uh, community service. So to really elevate uh, that aspect, and we do have some data collection uh, systems in place, but we'll, we'll have to um, adjust and roll out once that's uh, approved by the feds. But it's very much on the horizon. And what Shelley's been doing in CTE and the work we've been doing across disciplines has really put us in a very good position. We were talking about that earlier today. Questions, Jude. Thank you for your work. This is Jude, turn your mic on. Yes. This is a, I'm a newbie. <laughs> uh, this is where, really where we need to be headed. Um, I've had a lot of conversations in the community about this type of thing, applying um, the academics to real world experience to make our, our children, whether they choose the pathway that leads them straight to college or careers, that they're prepared. Um, to make inroads into those uh, careers. What I want to know is because there may be so many more students that could take advantage or would want to take advantage of these opportunities, do we have a, a, an idea of how many of the requests for CTE courses are we able to accommodate? Because as you said, it is increasing, mm -hmm. but what percentage of students that are interested in taking advantage of this opportunity are able to do so? Well, so far, we really are, have been, I mean, as students have made the request, um, we have been fortunate to be able to accommodate students. We do have, um, I have been the department chair for 13 years now, I think, and we had 13 teachers for a number of years. We now have 16 in the department, and that has been part of the growth and being able to accommodate the students that um, have requested the courses that um, we have to offer. And uh, it has been really, I think, our um, a goal it, to be able to accommodate students' requests for courses. And we have been able to do that. Um, we ha right now there is a wait list for geometry and construction, which is, um, is it's kind of painful to me. But we really can't grow geometry and construction more right now for a million reasons. And, um, but we really have made a very, uh, a, the best attempt possible to fit as many kids as we can into the courses. And let me just add that due to all of the innovation that you've heard here tonight from Ms. Gates, CTE has been dominating in our sectioning um, um, conversations. And for the past several years, I've gone to Eric and I've said, Eric, enrollment in CTE is up. Enrollment in CTE is up. And I've challenged all of the other department chairs to be as thoughtful and as innovative and creative as Shelley has done because kids are gravitating toward our, uh, the opportunities that we have in the CTE department. So we're managing a Thanks, huge Marcus. success here in awesome. CTE. Thanks, Marcus. Jonathan? <coughs> um, this is, is, is really impressive. And I, you know, we, we, over the years, we've gotten, I would, I would say flack I would, from like, people in the city of Evanston about, are we actually getting people into jobs? I mean, I just, mm -hmm. we've, we've heard that over the years. And I was wondering, do we, you know, we've, we've had in these discussions about uh, uh, defining college readiness, all of these resources that we can turn to. We know how many of our students not only, you know, went to, went to different kinds of colleges and so forth. Do we have the means of tracking the, the employment that that our students are going on to after this wonderful preparation? Well, I, I, that is challenging. It's not as easy to um, track students who have not gone a traditional um, 
either two-year or four-year college route. The National Clearinghouse obviously maintains, um, I think, pretty good data on, on students who are attending two- or four-year schools. But it's very challenging to collect information about students who have enrolled in an apprenticeship program, for example, or have gone to a short-term certification. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think that's an area that we could probably do a better job with. Um, we do try to do, get some kind of self-reporting of students as they're leaving. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm totally aware of the flack that we get for not having enough young people prepared for the various jobs in Evanston. I think we I mean, that's have, clearly not true. It, I mean, I, I, I didn't, I just threw that out there. Just no, to, you, you know, know what, I, I'm going to just say, yeah. it, there's part of it that is true, okay. um, because I think we don't, as much as we have these wonderful programs, we don't reach all the students to the full mm -hmm. extent. I mean, I think anybody who lives in Evanston knows young people who um, left here and they floundered um, and were not, they didn't have a clear pathway when they left here. And I, I think that is something that we really have to do a better job with. Um, but I also feel that it would be, um, it's something we need to um, work with the employers in Evanston. They need to step up a little bit more too. It, um, we sometimes, you know, um, I, I feel like it's a partnership and I also think that hiring high school students and um, students who are coming right out of high school, it does require employers to um, have a slightly different mindset than they would about hiring someone with a lot of experience. I wonder if the city might have some leverage with local employers since they have to get licenses and mm -hmm. permits and so forth mm -hmm. to, to have them report on their, their, their employment mm -hmm. of ETHS graduates. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that. Yeah. I think a lot of people in Evanston would like to see that. So we'll talk to our new mayor about that and see okay. what we can do. Yeah, I think that's an avenue uh, worth pursuing. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's self-reported. Right. Yeah, it's a good point. Gretchen. Um, so I was at uh, the great um, presentation at the Y with Monique the other day on, on maker spaces, in particular the Y maker space. Um, very fascinating. Um, and part of the presentation was about um, maker spaces generally, how they're very hot all across the world. Uh, within the United States and within Evanston. And besides the made of media space at the Y, there are a couple of other maker spaces throughout the city of Evanston. And I'm wondering how, how, if, how and if we plan to incorporate that sort of maker movement into what we're doing here. And it seems to me it's probably most closely aligned with the work that you're doing that's crossing disciplines and CTE um, related? Mm -hmm. Well, I consider our engineering labs to be maker spaces. Um, they're, they have some really expensive equipment that probably um, 3D Meta Media doesn't and have. And I mean, the <laughs> YOU is um, also putting in a maker space. I mean, so there's just different degrees of maker spaces. Um, yes. We are, uh, we have a lot of 3D printers and all kinds of really amazing equipment, which, by the way, we should probably all go on a tour of the CTE space, especially newer board members. I would be happy to mm -hmm. show you around so you could see. Um, I, the maker movement, I, I am fascinated by it. I think it's such a great way to, um, kind of that whole idea of tinkering and having kids have a more personalized experience with making things, um, I, that is very near and dear to our hearts. Well, and I'm also curious about how the, the maker movement um, can be um, connected more mm -hmm. than it already is with the craft movement, and, and this would involve, um, you know, a closer connection with our fine arts department. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. You know, for example, there are some ways in which, um, you know, traditionally female-centered crafts, stitching, knitting, um, you know, that kind of thing has been connected with the maker movement. And um, I would love to, you know, that may be another area for ex exploration to connect um, some of what we're doing in more traditionally male-dominated mm -hmm. kinds of fields um, to bring in... Um, not just to bring in more of our female students, because I think there are male students who would equally be interested in that craft piece mm -hmm. 
as well, which actually Agreed. is a segue to my one fairly quick question. I, I love how the CTE department is, reflects our student population in mm -hmm. terms of its makeup. However, within that overall number, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about the variation you may see from, because I'm, sure. I'm fairly certain that even though it averages out kind of nicely, that there's some differences mm -hmm. between who you see represented in those classes, mm -hmm. both by race and gender and all that kind of stuff. I, okay, and I didn't bring all of that data, but I, you are definitely correct. Um, in engineering, obviously one of the reasons we started the women in engineering class for um, the first level of engineering to have the women only section, um, it has been proven in other school districts to be a way to increase the pipeline so that more young women do go into engineering. And we are seeing that. Um, we have definitely a greater percentage of young women are in our engineering program than in the past few years. Um, I didn't bring that data with me, but I can I can share it with the board. If there's uh, some digestible version of that, that would be I yeah, think, interesting I, for right. everybody to see. Um, yes, I, I can definitely do that. Um, I would say uh, the other area that is probably the most um, gendered is in our early childhood program. Mm. Um, as many of you are aware, we do have a uh, daycare center here at ETHS, and our students um, take intro to child development, advanced child development. The vast majority of those students are female, um, and we would obviously like to see more young men um, get involved in that. I think many of them, I think there's a lot of stereotyping and um, bias that goes on still in this day and age where young people um, are susceptible to um, peer pressure and whatnot when they're signing up for classes. So that is one area. I have to say, though, in um, many of our other areas, in the business area, um, there are a few classes. Sports and entertainment marketing tends to be uh, male athletes in general, uh, but we are trying to um, work on that issue. It's kind of interesting. Um, the issue pops up in um, ways that we're not always expecting. Um, we had almost um, equal female male participation in geometry and construction the first year. We didn't pay as much attention to the recruitment of it. The second year, we ended up with more males. So this year, we um, kind of raised the um, visibility of the idea of girls uh, taking the class, and this year will be um, uh, pretty much 50-50 again. But it's something that we have to be very um, vigilant about because of the stereotype that's still going on out in the world, um, it's something that requires us to be um, really constantly making an effort. And I would say the same, the same issue, we do have an issue with um, students of color. Um, they are not as represented in the engineering program as, as we would um, like. And that's something else that we have to make sure that we're making a strong effort um, to increase that as well. So Thank that's you. a good point. How do you do that? How do you um, reach out to students of color, for example? Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of it has to do with role models. Um, Northwestern has a, a very active chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers. Right. Mm -hmm. And we try to, they're a, a, a challenging group of students to work with because they are so busy. I don't mm -hmm. know how engineering students have time to sleep, but yeah, they, they are always willing to come over. Um, we try to um, have opportunities for uh, role models, um, job shadows, different types of experiences so that students can um, see people who look like them and yeah. have possibly a, a similar um, uh, story to tell about their life. Um, but we, I again, I'm going to say that's something that we need to work a lot more on. Just um, like we do other um, we're intentional and Absolutely. think about it. Yeah. Yes. All right. Other questions, Jude, and then Mark. Just a comment. Um, okay. Are there what are the prerequisites for the CT program? And I'm specifically thinking about literacy. Mm -hmm. Is there um, a reading level that we're looking at in order for students to be successful in CT, or are there challenges when students? are enrolled in CT courses um, literacy-wise? We, we have, there's absolutely no um, prerequisites really for any CTE class for any 
any, uh, that's part of how CTE rolls. Mm -hmm. We're open to everybody. And so we offer, all of our classes are offered for honors or regular credit. So um, except for Project Lead the Way, which is offered at the AP grade weight. However, there are students, and we're learning more about this. We recently just had a professional development experience where we looked at um, the star reading results for students in CTE classes. and. The t some of the teachers were very surprised to see um, a relatively low reading score for some of their um, most successful students. So I do think there's ways that um, doing something in an applied way in a CTE class can really be motivational for kids to um, increase their reading levels and their literacy both in math and reading. Um, I, that's, I think that's a very good question, but we really don't have any requirements in terms of um, reading or math scores for kids to be in any of the CTE classes. I don't know if that really answers your question, but yes, it, um, it is very challenging to teach a CTE class because of that. Um, we have kids who are, you know, maybe have an IEP or a 504 plan and maybe have a relatively low uh, reading level, and they can be sitting next to kids who um, are high flyers who are also taking AP classes. They are all in the same class together. But I think that actually is really um, the best way to teach school um, because I think kids learn so much from each other. Um, they're, it's, it's another way to kind of bust a lot of those ideas that people have about who is smart and who is capable. Um, I think a CTE class is a great way for kids to really shine in a lot of different ways that maybe they don't feel like they can in some of their academic classes. I have a follow-up question to that. Mm -hmm. So that being the case, so you, you, you're likely to have students that are str struggling readers. Mm -hmm. Are we, um, what types of strategies are we using in interventions? Are we um, using differentiation? Are we tiering assignments? What sort, what sort yes, of I would say that? yes um, to all of that, and uh, as we, that is something we're going to be doing a lot more, um, kind of reviewing some of those strategies. We haven't looked at it in a while, and like I said, we actually had some of uh, the teachers struggling a little bit this year um, with the wide range of students in some of their classes, and that's why we had Kiwana Brown, who's our uh, literacy um, specialist here, at she came in and met with us, and we're planning on doing some additional uh, training with the teachers for next year. Awesome. Yes, it's definitely a concern, um, but it's something, I think we have a lot of resources <coughs> in the building to really help us with that. Absolutely. Thank Thanks. Mike? Um, I want to return just for a minute this, uh, the discussion you were having, Jonathan, was involved about, you know, can we track their success anyway and, and commenting on their employment possibilities at Evanston and what happens to students when, when they leave the program. And, you know, it occurs to me that we've had some success with uh, individual uh, post-secondary plans, mm -hmm. student by student. Mm -hmm. And could you speak to, you know, how do we incorporate that kind of, of work uh, mm -hmm. into, into your program? Okay, um, I am an active participant in our post-secondary planning committee, and we are looking at our ICAPs, which is what you're right. talking about ICAP. in terms of individual career uh, and academic plans. And uh, that we have, we're working really hard right now to, to make sure that we're incorporating um, all the experiences that students can have in a, a CTE class, for example, or in a fine arts class. How can we help kids? connect those um, experiences to the plans that they're making when they leave the high school. Uh, the kids get a lot of messaging here about what is the right thing to do when they leave high school. And most of the messaging, honestly, is about going to a four-year school. Um, and I think that is great for kids that if that's the match with what it is that they really want to do. Um, and that's the right choice for them. But we're still, um, yeah, that's, that's an area in my mind where we also need to do more work. I think we're getting closer um, because the ICAP process has been in place longer. Um, I think the counselors and uh, definitely the CTE teachers are much more aware of how to integrate those experiences. So if a kid goes on a job shadow or they're able to go on a work site visit and it has a really it really resonates with them that we can find ways to build on those experiences to help kids make better choices when they leave here. 
Shelly, to that, could you just talk for a second about the online um, mentoring with the business folks and the questions that students can ask that was oh, rolled out right. this year? So we are part of a regional program through Career Cruising, which is called Inspire the Future. And so our students are able to log on and um, go, I, they can, um, what are all the options? Mentors, job shadows, uh, they can ask questions of people in a variety of business fields. It's a relatively new program, um, but it is something that Michelle Vasquez in the College Career Center is working hard to really get it off the ground. We do need more employers to- What's it um, called again? It's called Inspire the Future. So if you go on the College and Career um, Center website, you would find Inspire the Future. Um, and uh, that is connected to our ICAP process, but unfortunately, Naviance and Career Cruising don't talk to each other um, in a um, technical sort of way. Uh, but we are looking at some ways to make those connections um, so that it's, it's easier for kids to participate in all those types of activities and have them come together for them in terms of what they're thinking about for their future. Thanks. I just have a quick comment. I think one way to um, dispel the myth that Evanston Township is not focused on getting our, our students ready for career and technical education could perhaps be to share the story more or share these efforts more. I know what you do and you know, my first intro was when my son was in sixth grade and he participated in the summer camp um, engineering program and then that exposed him to other opportunities in CT that he knew nothing about, that I knew nothing about. Um, I didn't think that that area was accessible to, <laughs> to middle schoolers. Um, and so, you know, I think we should probably do more of that and highlight more of this. I'm, I'm excited to see that there's something new this summer and there's a literacy focus with District 65 mm -hmm. um, and exposing more kids, um, especially those kids that think that that area is off limits um, mm -hmm. to them. So I believe this should be highlighted just as much as our athletics program is. You know, I think this is critical. Um, to our community and to what the school is doing for for our students. So um, that was a small paragraph about you know that exposure at sixth, seventh, mm -hmm. and eighth grade. But I think it's mm -hmm. it's an important one to um, get our kids interested in this earlier before they enter into the high school. I totally agree, yeah. and I that's a big concern that I have because District 65 doesn't have a lot of they. In fact, I don't think they have. Um, any of the CTE areas. I know they're gonna start teaching coding, I think, and they're doing more robotics, mm -hmm. which I think is great. Sure. But um, just in terms of even talking to kids about different right. careers at the middle school level, that is developmentally really an appropriate thing to do. And um, many school districts have had a lot of success with that in terms of engaging students in mm -hmm. school and understanding why they're taking the classes they're taking. Um, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but even here at ATHS, we could do a lot more to um, help kids know about all these options. I mean, there's kids who graduate here in senior year, and they'll say, I didn't know we had engineering at ETHS, which, of course, makes me want to yeah. sob. Yes. But um, that's something, you know, that's an ongoing problem. We have so much here. It's hard for the kids right. to know about everything. Right. But right. Um, it might be time for us to think about doing an elective fair, and I've talked to Marcus about that. But... Thinking about putting that on seems a little overwhelming right now in May. I'm like, I don't, don't know. Don't think about do it in May. Well, I mean, <laughs> right now, right? Like, I just can't think of it. But I think that is, um, I think it's something that we uh, probably need to do because I think as kids go through here, if they didn't take something freshman year, they may not know about it. And I, so I think that's something that we need to take a look at too. Put it out there. Yeah. yeah. Like even you. before they, they get here, mm -hmm. that fair has to be when they're in, in middle school planning. I think that's, for the high that's a great idea. Yeah. It is. Well, thank you so much, Shelly. You are so welcome. <laughs> thank you for okay. having me. I appreciate it. And I will um, I try to get some more data to you. And okay. um, as all of you know how to, uh, how to get a hold of me, if you want to come on a tour, please just let me know. We give tours all the time. We'd love to have all of you. Um, and if you have other ideas for us or names of employers to add to the Inspire the Future um, 
send any information my way. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. All right. So moving right along, we are at comments from the public. <laughs> <laughs> there are none. I looked. All right. And the answer is none. None. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do we have? Uh, we we do have a FOIA. You yeah. want to uh, yeah. mention that? Yeah, we have a uh, FOIA from uh, Bachman, and the uh, it, it's in, the response is in your um, packet. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're at board committee reports. We have two reports that were in the packet, um, one from the Park School Advisory Committee that was held um, May 9th, and then the Discipline Committee meeting. So they're both um, in the packets. Any questions about those from board members? If not, we will continue. Uh, we are at the student board report. Emma, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to <laughs> say. Don't feel any pressure. <laughs> We've allotted 15 minutes. <laughs> but no pressure. No pressure. Um, I guess I'd just like to take this opportunity to say that I'm really looking forward to working with all of you, and I'm so honored to be here, and thank you so much. And I will not ramble on for 15 minutes, I promise, but <laughs> that about sums it up. Nice. Thank, you. thank you. That was a good start. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Very good. All right. Uh, superintendent's report. Well, the year's wrapping up, so my report is uh, rather brief. Uh, but I do want to uh, uh, just kind of mention again that uh, we did have the uh, Senior Awards Night uh, last week. And uh, congratulations to all of the seniors who won scholarships and were honored. And it was just a joy to hear about each of them and their achievements and, and their dreams and to realize uh, how uh, wonderful this generation really is. I do want to highlight uh, the congratulations to Patricia Kamaya and Jordan Wallace, who were recipients of the North End Mothers Club Award and the Oliver Beatty Cunningham Memorial Prize for the Outstanding Senior Awards. So uh, both to Patricia and to Jordan, congratulations. Uh, also, um, uh, on our website and in our news releases, you will be able to see that we have six of our seniors who actually are winners of the prestigious National Merit Scholarship Award. So congratulations to them wow. as well. Um, we have several fine arts events coming up yet this week. Uh, the Spring Choral Concert is tomorrow evening at 7. The Spring Orchestra Concert is going to be held Thursday. Uh, at 7.30 in the auditorium. Both events are free. Uh, and the Short Play Festival, uh, which is the, uh, the wrap-up of our theater season, will be held in the Upstairs Theater on Wednesday and on Friday, and uh, each evening at 7.30, and there are tickets available online. Oh, what did I say, Lauren Roland? Wednesday and Thursday. Oh, Wednesday and Thursday. Oh, yeah, I said Friday, didn't I? Wednesday and th <laughs> the 25th and the 27th. That's what's written here. Is that wrong? I think it is wrong. Thursday okay. is the 25th. <laughs> is it? Check online. It's back to that Thursday, Friday. Yeah, it's Thursday, Friday, right? I think Thursday, you're right. Friday. Thursday, Friday. So uh, that'd be 26th and 27th. So, um, well, we, only one number off there. Um, <laughs> Thursday and Friday. <laughs> As a reminder, there's no school on Monday. It's Memorial Day. And then semester exams will begin on Tuesday the 30th. Uh, the last day of school is Monday, June 5th. The first day of summer school is uh, Wednesday, June 7th. Uh, and finally, uh, this Saturday will be the last Wild, and that is the 27th, will be the last Wild Kid Academy of the year. Uh, usually it's highly attended right before final exams. Uh, and that's it.
That is truly it. Wow. That's it. A lot. The year, the year is winding, it's winding down. down. Wow. All right. So we are at our action items, and the first action item is the approval of the Wild Kit card vendors. And we have Michael Pond and uh, Nolan Robinson here uh, to just give you a, uh, uh, an overview of what this project is, and we are so pleased to uh, finally be able to bring it to you. This has been many years in the works. So Mr. Pond, am I turning it over to you? Yeah, you'll turn things over to me. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to the board, the administration, for uh, having us here this evening. Uh, Nolan and I are here to talk to you about the our kit card proposal. Uh, everybody should have a copy of the kit card uh, program that was provided to you. Uh, and we're going to take you through a couple of slides and give you a little bit of the history behind this. So uh, what is a kit card exactly? It's modeled after uh, Northwestern University's uh, wild card. Uh, and the wild card has uh, been around for a while. Uh, actually, I remember when I was in college, I was able to use it. So it's been in existence, and we're trying to catch up with Northwestern 20 years later. Um, our, uh, the goal of the, the wild card is that it provides discounts uh, on um, services or to uh, diners at local restaurants, um, uh, small discounts to local shopping, and uh, they, uh, all the Northwestern students get it through their um, student IDs. And the hope is that we can do something similar here. So I'm going to uh, take you... Uh, down a trip of memory lane here and give you a little bit of background for how we arrived at this. So um, the kit card idea has been kicked around for at least seven years here at Evanston Township High School, going all the way back to Sean Pitt, who some of you might know as um, uh, a esteemed former uh, student rep to the board. Uh, Who's now a college graduate, and we're still working on it. We're still working on it. Um, but ho hopefully the vision's going to get nearer right, right here tonight. Um, and uh, uh, he had been championing this idea for a few years, and it had been kicked around student council. And um, about uh, four years ago, uh, I got together with some members of student council. We decided to create a new body, a student senate, which would focus on more policy-oriented activities, sort of like uh, what we're trying to accomplish with the kit card tonight. And so now, four years later, um, here we are. Uh, we have a um, prototype uh, ready to show you uh, with thanks to Nolan Robinson, who's been championing uh, the kit card all year. And one of the things we're hoping to see through is that um, before Nolan graduates, that's sort of our, our gift to him, uh, we're going to be able to make this happen. So I'm going to turn it over to Nolan, who's going to talk to you a little bit about um, how this came to be, uh, what our kit card program would look like here, um, and then we'll kick it back to me and we'll talk a little bit about why we're coming to you for approval. Ooh. Hi, everybody. My name is Nolan Robinson. Uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, so this slide is really about why we want the kit card. So first point is students want it. Um, I can't begin to tell you how many students and staff members alike have wanted something like this because we shop at so many stores and places downtown Evanston and we don't like to spend that much money on it. And we know that um, Northwestern students have something similar and they're part of Evanston just as we are, so we'd like something that they have. Um, so there's a uh, second point, enhances community involvement. So there's this phenomenon, uh, it happens with me, I'm sure it happens with you all, it happens with my mom all the time. But we walk past the store for years and we never walk in it, but as soon as we see a 50% off sign, we walk in and we wanna spend money there. Um, so if students and staff members see this in that window, the kit card accepted here, they'll visit places that they normally wouldn't have before. And um, stores and businesses and restaurants that were probably in the dark will be in the light now because of this. And which brings us to our last point, improves the local economy by making sure that Evanston dollars stay local. So this is how it works. So local vendors apply via the vendor application form on our website. And our website right now is still under construction, and it's a singular website on a Weebly right now, and we'd like to integrate that into a separate page on the ETHS uh, district website. Um, after approval from, I'm uh, assuming, the board, 
um, we publish their discount like Northwestern has on their link. And then the students and staff visit the vendors or shops restaurant once they see that their business is posted online. They see the kick card accepted here decal in the window. And all they have to do is present their school issued staff or student ID. And then the vendor will apply the discount or special bonus for their entire order or for a specific product. And this is an example of the website we've been working on. It's still um, got some stuff to do, but here's our homepage. The second tab is the discounts. So that's the tab that shows every discount that each business has about, gives a brief history, kind of like Mr. Pond introduced. Um, a contact form, so our email address is evanstonkitcard at eths202.org. So if businesses or even um, staff or students have questions about the kit card, they can contact that email address and we will get back to them very swiftly. And there's the vendor application form which businesses can fill out if they'd like to be a part of the program. So um, why are we here looking for your approval? We, um, after going through this process and sitting down with the administration and having conversations about how we can roll this out, um, we uh, had conversations with our uh, district attorneys uh, and wanted to make sure that everything that we were trying to do was going to line up with uh, the policies uh, set forth uh, in our district. And so if you turn uh, to page three of the kit card program handout that you received, you'll see the board policy specifically that we're looking at. It's in uh, section 825. Uh, no part of the school district, including facilities, the name, the staff, and the students shall be used for advertising or promoting the interests of any commercial company, except as authorized by and consistent with administrative procedures and approved by the board. So what we're trying to do here is ensure that uh, we have a mechanism in place whereby uh, vendors that we reach out to through the local chamber of commerce, the city of Evanston, and other business partners um, are able to provide information for vendors to apply to become uh, kit card applicants and then kit card vendors. Our student senate, uh, which is sponsored by me, would look at the first round of applicants. We would then take the uh, applications to our administration, to Dr. Campbell, to Dr. Witherspoon, uh, where they would look to make sure that all of the vendors that are applying to provide discounts uh, meets our board, uh, or excuse me, our district standards. And then we would send that list of vendors uh, to you all uh, for approval, in which we would then publish them along with their business information and discount uh, on a web page connected with our district website. And so that ultimately is what we're looking to accomplish today is to move to hopefully accept our kit card uh, program, um, provided there aren't any questions. Gretchen. I have one question. Congratulations on getting this done. I've been on the board the entire time uh, that, that various people have been trying to have it, have it done. So this is really exciting. Great work. Um, one question, because Northwestern already does this, it seems to me the most logical place to start in your outreach efforts is to coordinate with Northwestern or just look at their website maybe and get a list of their vendors and that should be your starting point. And I, I just, I didn't see Northwestern listed as a reaching out to external collab collaborators, but it would seem to me that we should include them there. I think it's really thrilling because I get very frustrated every time I go to a business in Evanston who advertises the Wildcat discount and I said, well, what about um, Evanstonian, tax-paying Evanstonians or our kids who go to school um, here who, you know, arguably spend even more money because they're here year-round and well beyond four years usually. Um, so I think, I think this is just marvelous and, and thank you very much for getting it off cool. the ground, finally. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and you're right, and we actually have reached out to Northwestern, so we've connected with uh, the, the group that's responsible for administering the program, and actually our form uh, that we have, our application form, is modeled almost identically to uh, what they have, although what we would include is language about our district policies that would go out as well, because obviously the age group is a little yeah. bit different for Northwestern right. versus us. No bars, yeah, no absolutely. liquor stores. Correct, right. absolutely. correct. Right, mm -hmm. good, to, good to know. <laughs> Great. Other questions? Jonathan. 
I, I do remember Sean Pitt, and I don't want to slow this down a second, um, but I have three small questions. Mm -hmm. um, first is, is there, would there be a minimum discount required? In other words, would somebody be able to sign up and then just say, well, a penny less if, 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 you're, if you're from ETHS? I suppose that's a fair question. I don't think that we've broached that internally together. Uh, and uh, I suppose it is something that could happen, although I would imagine that might be some poor business practice if that's what they're, if that's what they're going for. Um, however, it, it, yeah, it probably would be useful for us to set up perhaps some guidelines for uh, minimum discounts or something like that, or uh, to perhaps give them a, a menu of suggested type discounts. Yeah. yeah. So the second question I had is, and I think I'm just, I think maybe we can streamline this, but I don't know if we'll have to run this by the lawyers, but I understand the policy concern, but I'm wondering if we can't just, as a board, establish the program and the criteria and then authorize the superintendent to approve the particular list of right. vendors. That would speed yeah. it up. Yes. Wouldn't yeah. that streamline yeah. that would, things a bit? Yeah. That would speed it up. Yes. And yes. I think that that probably would pass legal muster. As long as we've set up the program, we've set up the criteria, and we've authorized the superintendent mm -hmm. to, to make up the list, yes. there's no reason they should That's have to no bring the list back, should, back, back yeah. to yeah. us. Yep. That would be awesome. Um, yep. yeah. The last thing is, is um, on the, in two places in the program, we talk about the um, uh, complying with district policies, prohibiting discrimination, and we have left out gender identity. <laughs> in the list where it says race, color, national origin, religion, sex, handicap. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, especially yeah. in light of the recent conversation, yeah. that's a absolutely fair point, yeah. and we can certainly add that. Great. Otherwise, it looks great. Great. Oh, Wonderful. All right. So thank you very much. No, I think we have. You're right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so we need a motion um, to approve. And I think we're going to. Um, As modified. We're going to modify this a bit. Five. So we'll work on the modification. But I think we can. Still, Consistent with discussion. Yeah, right. We can still make that motion. Do so I have a motion? Second. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Yay. Great work. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. I, I just have to point out, so Nolan will never take advantage of a Wildcat card. Oh. But he will have a Wildcat card in the very oh, near future. Yeah. All right. Congratulations. Yes. Yes. Congratulations to you, Nolan. Okay. Good. All right. So moving right along, um, approval of carpet flooring replacement bid. And there's some information in the packet about that, Mary, right? There were four attendees at our pre-bid meeting and only two chose to bid, and there's quite a big difference between the two bids, so yes. we're going to go with the lowest. <laughs> All right. Okay. Motion, please. Move to approve. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Thank you. Um, so we're at the consent agenda, which includes the treasurer's report from March of 2017, approval of bills, personnel agenda, appointments to staff, certified summer school, and addendum. is there's an addendum? addendum? Yes. And the addendum? Uh, that's it. Move approval. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 All right. Old or new business? Any old or new business? I, I have an item of old business. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, I brought up the, the, this question of de defining what we mean by honors and, and how we have um, pro we've in establishing a common definition or, or philosophy of honors, because we've had a pro proliferation of honors. So now we have straight honors, 
We have mixed honors, which some, some with additional work, some with more rigorous grading. We have earned honors based on commons assessments, and coming soon we have portfolio-based honors. And the, question, the issue that I raised back then is that um, college admissions officers need to know what an H following a course listing on an ETHS transcript means. And I, there was some talk about setting up a committee to look at this, and I just don't know if anything's happened. <laughs> we did explore at the grading committee. We could certainly write that up. Um, we worked with our college career counselor who said it was a moot point. It doesn't really yeah, it doesn't matter mean. in terms of the college piece. No, they don't ask. Um, but internally, it might be a nice document to have so that we can start moving some folks who are doing, let's do more for more sake. Let's do more of the same toward a uh, more rigorous assessment profile, whether that be a portfolio-based or, right. or um, a common assessment-based piece. But I do think that there's yeah. value in, uh, in writing those findings up. But from the college perspective, it was a, it was a non-starter with uh, yeah, this area. But internally, I think it's important. It would be, be a very helpful guiding document moving forward. I mean, I, 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 as I think I said it at the time, I mean, I'd be interested in hearing what the college and career service people say because my personal experiences with a number of kids in college meetings with advise, um, admissions people is they talk about taking the most rigorous courses that are available to you at your school and then, the, well, what about honors? Versus, and then it's clear that for a lot of admissions officers what honors means is not clear particularly since it can vary so much from school to school, and, and, and at ETHS it varies within the school. Right. So. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. so does that mean that we're going to, yeah. you'll provide some kind of report, right. Dr. Vegas. Okay, that's fine. Other older new business? Anybody? Um, polling of the board? Anything anyone would like to add other than welcoming Emma once again? Yes. All right. Yeah, I have one little thing. Oh, Sorry. certainly. No, um, just as the new, one of the new people, I had the privilege of being at the uh, honors, um, uh, the awards night on Wednesday, last Wednesday. Yes. And, um, and then tonight with all the students that we've had an opportunity to see, this is just an amazing place. And these kids are they just blow me out of the water. If I was half of what they were at 18 or 16, uh, I'd probably be something else today. I don't know. Uh, because uh, to, to a, a person, they were amazing. And just reading their bios and all the accomplishments and community service, as well as all the academics, it speaks to, number one, and, and most importantly, how amazing they are but also it speaks to the great opportunities that they have in this school and this community. So I just have to applaud uh, everyone involved, the students first and foremost, but the school as well. So thanks Fabulous. for letting me be a part of that. Thank you, thank you. That was a great night, you're right. Mark? I just wanted uh, quickly to give a shout out to the baseball team that just concluded a very successful season. Uh, another in a long, long uh, run of 20 game seasons where we won more than 20 games. Uh, and uh, these are kids that have put in, especially the seniors, have put in a tremendous amount of time and effort and work uh, that lasts pretty much throughout the year for all the time they've been at ETHS. And their, their season's coming to a close, and playoffs begin at Maine South High School in the regional on Thursday. Wow. Congratulations to the team, and good luck. Mm -hmm. All right. Gretchen? I just wanted to say welcome to Emma. Um, really great to have you here. And it's too bad honor is gone, but bye, bye honor. Um, I think you'll find it very rewarding. And I just wanted to wish all our graduating seniors the best of luck and all the rest of those students good luck on finals. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Last day for seniors is Thursday. Wow. And behave yourself, right? Yeah, behave seniors. yourself, please. All right, thank you very much, everybody. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.